about your investments with just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Hello and welcome and thanks for choosing Bloomberg Quint this Tuesday morning. You're watching Daybreak with me, Alex Matthew. First, let's look at the headlines. Asian markets tread cautiously ahead of China's GDP growth numbers for the first quarter of 2018. They're expected to come in at 6.8%. Donald Trump accuses China and Russia of devaluing their currencies, breaking away from his own Treasury Department's view that no major trading partners are currency manipulators. The Met Department forecasts a normal monsoon for the third successive year in India, says India is likely to receive 97% of the long period average of rainfall in this year. Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar says concerns over India's banking system being stuck in a logjam are unfounded. Let's turn to the international markets now and it was a strong end to trade on Monday's Wall Street session with all three major in, uh, averages ending the day with gains of almost a percent each. The positivity, it seems, stems from the shift in focus from geopolitical tension to earnings. Abigail Doolittle of Bloomberg News tells us more about that session. Stocks rallied in Monday's Wall Street session with the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq all climbing by about seven tenths of one percent or more. Now, these gains did come as investors turn toward the first quarter earnings season for cues on what's next for the markets. So far, many of the big banks have reported and have put up solid results with Bank of America reporting on Monday, helping those shares climb on the day along with the financial sector overall. In fact, all 11 of the S&P 500 sectors finished higher on Monday, led by telecom, materials and utilities testifying to the breadth of Monday's rally. As for the top point boost for the S&P 500, though, that was Microsoft, up more than 1% as other tech giants climbed as well, such as Apple, Alphabet, and Intel. And after the bell, this is a consumer discretionary stock, but Netflix soared on a very strong uh, quarterly report and solid guidance for the second quarter, especially relative to net streaming ads. Investors liking that with those shares trading higher in the post-market session. From a stock perspective then, Monday certainly had a risk on tone, but not supporting it overall was the fact that oil was down more than 1%. Bonds were basically about flat to down uh, just slightly, not really selling off in the way you might expect with the stock rally, while the heat even Japanese yen actually rallied. Those market nuances may just suggest more volatility up or down is ahead for stocks. But on Monday, the Dow, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq all finished higher. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. Now, a short while back, in fact, even yesterday, there was a lot of chatter about the fact that India made it to the list of, uh, rather the watch list of the U.S. Treasury with regard to currency manipulation. But in fact, the more interesting thing is the, that President Donald Trump accused China and Russia of devaluing their currencies, breaking from his own Treasury chief's view that no major trading partners are currency manipulators. To find out more, listen to this report by Stephen Engel of Bloomberg News. Of course, Treasury has this semi-annual report that comes out, uh, and they have the opportunity to name uh, the 12 biggest trading partners of the United States, uh, either currency manipulator or not. They released that on Friday, and they did not name any nation a currency manipulator. China is on the Treasury Department's watch list, uh, so, of course, in the crosshairs, but not named a currency manipulator. Russia is not in on the list. It is not one of the 12 top trading partners. So that's what's also perplexing. As you said, he's naming out Russia and China as using currency uh, in an unacceptable way. And the immediate reaction, as you mentioned, in the market, the Bloomberg dollar index slipping to its lowest since March uh, 2020. Six strategists say uh, weak dollar uh, expectations will remain entrenched in the market as long as these kind of contradictions or talking down the dollar well, from the, the thing, president. Is, is the U.S. really doing the, the currency devaluating? Because in the end, we're, we've seen the renminbi up some 10 percent in the past year. The ruble as well has had some significant it, moves up. In, in the last year, the renminbi is up about 10 percent versus the dollar. In fact, it hit its highest uh, since 2015 in March. The ruble, though, keep in mind, it's weakened a bit, quite a bit, 9 percent uh, versus the dollar over the last year. But much of that is because of U.S. sanctions right. against Russia. Well, we've spoken about the uh, China GDP numbers and Asian markets are trading cautiously ahead of the release of those numbers that come up 
just a short while from now, in fact, around 7.30. The Nikkei in Japan is flitting between uh, gains and losses. It's currently down about 0.04%. Uh, the China market has, in fact, opened in the green, but we'll have to watch how that pans out. Now, speaking about China's uh, GDP numbers, China's economy is giving no clear sign yet that trade tensions and a financial cleanup are slowing growth. Analysts are expecting China's GDP in the first quarter of 2018 to grow at 6.8%. Tom McKenzie of Bloomberg News has this report on the key expectations. So the forecast for growth of 6.8% for the first quarter, that would be in line with the previous three quarters of growth. Of course, the Chinese government have set themselves that handy target of about 6.5% growth here in China by the end of the year. It seems like there's some pretty strong domestic activity in terms of demand. The retail sector, we're expecting to get those numbers out as well at 10 o'clock Hong Kong time. We're expecting to see retail sales up about 9.7%. The consumer consumer here in China still relatively bullish. So that is providing something of a protection against these trade tensions that are happening and of course against the monetary and fiscal tightening that is also taking place in China. You've also got the global demand pitch as well. That's providing something uh, of a strength as well, something of a driver for the growth here in China. We heard from the PBOC Governor Yi Gang speaking last week. He said that the early economic indicators were looking positive, so we may get a surprise to the upside. He said overall the growth picture for China was looking fairly robust. But of course course, trade tensions are a key potential headwind. Over to the trade setup for the day in India. Jesh Kilani is here to tell you all about that. Morning, Jesh. Morning, Alex. So, you know, uh, it's not looking uh, that great uh, as far as uh, the Indian market is concerned, given that uh, what uh, the overnight queues were, so the Dow Jones closed more than 200 points higher. But if you look at the SGX uh, Nifty, that is pointing to a lower start by about 10 points. Remember that, uh, you know, short time back, this was actually trading positive. So it has actually come off the day's high. So has, uh, you know, the other Asian indices like the Nikkei that has come off the day's high. But plenty of stock specific action can be expected given more how the ADRs actually closed. Most of the them were mixed, uh, led by Tata Motors, uh, that was down more than 2%, followed by ICICI Bank and Vedanta. In terms of the losers, we had, uh, you know, from, uh, the gainers, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we had Infosys and Wipro, which uh, closed more than 2% higher, while we had Dr. Eddy's and HGFC Bank, which also closed in the positive. But when it comes to the commodity queues, uh, plenty of action can be expected over there as well. So crude at the moment is, uh, you know, gaining about half a percent, but remember it did slide nearly 2% overnight. If you look at uh, the base metal space, uh, a lot of action over there as well. The LME base metal index, in fact, uh, you know, climbed to the highest level, uh, climbed the most uh, since uh, Feb 14. Uh, if you look at uh, aluminum, that has resumed its uh, upward uh, trend. That was up about uh, 5%, followed by, you know, uh, you had something like uh, nickel and uh, lead also, which gained nearly 3% each. If you look at uh, the precious metal space, that is also not doing that bad. In fact, gold uh, yesterday closed above the 1350 mark for an ounce. Now, let's look at uh, you know some of the fund flows that we got uh, over uh, so, you know, the FIs uh, sold about 400 crores uh, yesterday, while uh, the domestic institutions pumped in more than 300 crores. But for the month, if you look at it, uh, the trend continues. Uh, the foreigners have sold nearly 910 crores uh, for the month, while the domestic uh, institutions have pumped in as much as 3,500-odd crores. Now, you know, some of the key indices that we have, if you look at, uh, so it was, it was largely a positive day yesterday. So you had the Nifty Bank, which gained half a percent, uh, and you have the Nifty mid-cap and the BSE small cap index which continued their uh, gains for the second straight day uh, closed about 0.5 uh, to 0.9 percent higher if you look at uh, some of the sector gainers and losers that we have uh, so you know we had nifty reality and nifty pharma those closed more than 1.5 percent higher for themselves as far as the losers are concerned we had the nifty PSU bank and the nifty IT index which declined in trade now if you look at the volatility index as well that actually surged uh, nearly 1 percent and in fact it actually snapped its two days losing streak uh, for the India volatility index as far as the contribution is concerned what led to the near 50 point gain on the nifty uh, it was led by IGFC twins followed by ITC and Kotak Mahindra Bank as far as the losers were concerned uh, we had Infosys Tata Motors SBI Reliance uh, which actually declined about 38 points in trade Thanks so much for that Jesh now We'll, uh, of course, come back to this and uh, there'll be a specific focus on FNO later in the day. But for now, let's move 
and uh, shift focus to the rupee and the bond market. Saloni Dhanuka has all the updates there. Morning, Saloni. Good morning, Alex. So, it was quite a volatile trading day for the Indian rupee. It weakened by close to 30 paise or four tenth of a percent yesterday to close at over a six month low of 65.49 levels against the dollar. Now, this was on the back of widening uh, trade deficit concerns amid heightened geopolitical con uh, worries. Now, inclusion of India on US currency manipulator list also dampened uh, currency market sentiments. Elsewhere, rising crude oil prices along with on ongoing global trade war concerns largely weighed on the rupee. Now, speaking of bond market, sovereign bonds declined yesterday as yield on the 10-year uh, benchmark security rose nearly 6 basis point to end at 7.49%. Now, in terms of flows into debt market, global funds reduced their rupee debt holdings yesterday for the second consecutive session. They reduced their debt portfolio in the tune of 840 crores, according to NSDL data. Well, on the global front, dollar extended declines despite a rebound in retail sales data it rose uh, nearly six tenth of a percent in March, thereby snapping a three-month decline. Elsewhere, British pound hits a post-Brexit high of 1.43 levels against the dollar, uh, largely supported by hopes of a better Brexit deal and expectations of a central bank rate hike in the near term. And lastly, speaking of dollar rupee, now it is trading flat in the non-deliverable forward markets, which indicates a flat opening for Indian rupee in today's trade. Thanks so much for that, Saloni. Let's shift focus now to the commodity space and Jayesh Kilnani briefly touched about uh, on this but he wants to take you through uh, more detail. Jayesh, uh, I'm thinking you're going to start with oil. That's right, Alex. Uh, so oil price is currently trading about uh, half a percent higher, uh, but one has to remember that overnight we did see a near 2% uh, fall. That is from the tier 3 year high that oil had actually posted for itself. Uh, now, you know, uh, oil prices also broke uh, their five day winning streak to end lower overnight. Now, uh, why, why is this so? Is because uh, Bloomberg survey indicates uh, that uh, the US uh, crude oil inventory is likely to rise as much as 1.5 million barrels for last week. So we'll have to wait and watch for that. On the other hand, uh, some of the brokerages that we have picked up. Uh, JP Morgan has the interesting one and they say that oil may rise towards uh, $80 per barrel if Iran if Iran sanctions actually resume. So really, you know, we'll have to wait and watch uh, what ha uh, how the entire situation pans out. Uh, but shifting focus to the base metal space, the LME base metal index, uh, in fact, posted its biggest jump since 14th of Feb. Now, this was largely led by aluminium, which resumed its upward trend and closed about 5% higher and touched its highest uh, level since 2011. Now, what, what the market is actually contemplating is the possibility that uh, Rusal will actually be forced to cut its production and also, you know, uh, the lead and zinc prices were in focus and nickel too, which gained more than 2% each. Now, that is because uh, global zinc uh, market uh, actually has recorded a small surplus for itself. Uh, that is according to data published by uh, the international lead, zinc and uh, supply group that uh, we have. Um, so, you know, we'll have to wait and watch for how uh, the entire uh, aluminium and zinc trade actually plays out. Uh, as far as the precious metals are concerned, we did see uptick in gold prices largely on account of uh, dollar which has recorded, uh, you know, a new low for the month of April. Thanks, Jayesh, for that. Now, moving on to some good news. India's Met Department has said that India is likely to experience normal monsoon for the third successful year. It is pegged rainfall in 2018 at 97% of the long period average. Here's a quick report on IMD's first forecast for the year. As per our forecast this year, it is 97 percentage plus or minus 5 percentage. Most of these forecasts also are indicating normal to above normal rainfall. Chief economist at Care Ratings, Madan Sabnavis, is of the view that the spatial spread of rainfall will be important to watch out for. 
Speaking to Bloomberg Quint earlier, Subnavis also added that despite a good monsoon, farm income will still depend on the government's minimum support price and procurement process. Listen in. What is going to be important is the spatial spread because we have noticed in the past that in case certain geographies do not receive normal monsoon, there could be uh, certain deviations in terms of production for specific crops, especially those grown in peninsular India, which are typically in the rain shadow area. But assuming the spread is also okay, we should remember that while a good monsoon could lead to a good output, it may not really translate into higher incomes for farmers because in the last two years when we had uh, normal monsoons, we have realized that uh, agricultural prices had fallen, which had led to the incomes of farmers really being affected. So while a good monsoon wealth spread will definitely lead to higher output, in terms of income, it depends a lot on what the government does in terms of fixing the minimum support price as well as having the procurement systems in place. Moving on to an exclusive conversation, India must achieve double-digit growth in order to meet its employment aspirations. That's a word coming in from Niti Aayog Vice Chairman Rajiv Kumar. Speaking to Bloomberg Quinn's Tamanna Inamdar, Kumar also said that the perception that the Indian banking sector is in a crisis is not fair. Listen into a slice of that conversation. My own take has been that uh, banks, both private and public sector, their governance, their compliance, their regulatory framework, etc., all needs uh, a, a, a good look. I've, uh, I've personally um, uh, gone through the Nike committee report again, and I feel there are lots of gem, lots of good things, uh, you know, in there, and which we should be looking at at this point of time. Uh, <clears throat> the banking, the banking sector, has, however, on sort of started, uh, you know, uh, giving out money in the sense that you know that the, you know, credit growth uh, to uh, industry, the non-food credit has started growing. So the fear that the banking sector had kind of been caught in a logjam and uh, sort of frozen, I think that's not there. And uh, there are, there are, you know, and there is rather smart growth in some of the private sector banks and especially, uh, you know, the growth of trucks and tractors and, and, and autom automobile and two-wheeler is rising on the crust, crest of, you know, retail loan. So what has happened is that the nature of banking credit has changed from that being very focused on project lending to, I think, retail lending and to, you know, and, 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 and I suppose moving forward to agricultural lending, etc. But I think this, um, this attempt, if you like, at, at, at uh, seeing, at sort of positing a crisis in the banking sector, I think that's not fair. I want to come back to what you said in the speech, where you had a, a GDP target of 7.5% uh, for 18-19, an average of 85 up to 2022, and uh, double digits in 2022. What are you basing that on, sir, uh, looking at uh, uh, the situation that exports are in currently, uh, the trade deficit has widened, um, manufacturing is still gasping to get itself up to previous levels, uh, what drives this optimism, Mr. Kumar? Look, for the first time, the economy is the, the economic system is much more transparent, uh, much more, much cleaner, much formal, etc. And so that will make this growth not a just a spurt, no, not just a sort of you know a flash in the pond, but a sustained recovery. And find the other thing that I said to you uh, in, my, in my speech that the government's uh, focus on inclusion and uh, putting more money and putting more public services in the hands of the poor will mean higher productivity, will mean higher consumption demand, and that will and that'll push this growth. But you know, my real, real optimism comes from the fact that the, in India at the moment, uh, the, there is, the process of putting together in place a development state is on and is being pursued relentlessly. And that will be, enable us to close the gulf between the private and public sector. And once these two come on the same page, I don't think there's anything that's stopping India from achieving double-digit growth, which we must achieve uh, you know, uh, to, to meet our employment aspirations and requirements. Well, on to the stocks that are in the news. Shraddha Babla is here with the stocks to watch. Morning, Shraddha. 
Good morning, Alex. I'm going to start off with uh, Jay Bharat Maruti, which reported earnings after market hours yesterday. A mixed set of numbers coming in, though. While revenues were down about 1%, net profit uh, fell by a sharper 14%, and that's mainly on account of a higher tax outgo. But operationally, uh, the it was a good performance with EBITDA ri rising by about 14%, and EBITDA margins saw an improvement of 130 basis points to 10%. That apart of Bajaj Electricals, which has bagged orders worth uh, 3,580 crores you have Shobha Limited which is 48 into Gujarat and they've said that they'll be investing about 500 crores in residential project in Gift City. Blue Star has signed a pact with Sands International for distributing its products in Saudi Arabia. Um, then you have JM Financial Unit which has acquired additional 8.8 uh, lakh shares in uh, microfinance company Spandana Financial. So with this uh, the share of JM Financial's, um, JM Financial's unit in the company uh, now stands at 12.95%. Uh, that apart, you have a Times of India report which says that Phoenix Mills and uh, CPPI BJV, uh, that will buy LNT land in Bangalore for about 700 crores. Uh, also some developments with respect to, with uh, regards to Idea Cellular, and this is on the back of a Mint report, which says that uh, the Aditya Billa group is in talks with some of the private equity funds to sell uh, stakes in uh, the promoter entities which control Idea uh, to be able to raise $1 billion for Idea. So that's another stock to watch. A couple of bulk deals also uh, on the back of which uh, we expect stocks to be in focus. So GSS Infotech is one name where Nomura Singapore bought 0.6% stake. Then you also have Team Lee Services where Franklin in India smaller companies fund bought 1.8% stake in a bulk deal and then you had the promoter HR Offshore Ventures selling 1% and another promoter NED Consultants selling half a percent stake. So the total uh, promoter group uh, selling 1.5% stake in Team Lee Services. And then finally you also have Majesco where the promoter Sudhakar Ram sold 0.5% stake. So some of these may also uh, react to this news, Alex. Thanks so much for that, Shraddha. Now, recently, you must have heard that Jet Airways and Indigo Airlines have pulled out of the race for Air India. Now, it seems RSS Chief Mohan Bhagwat is of the opinion that Air India is not being administered properly. He also believes that Air India should only be run by an Indian firm. Samasya, Air India chalti nahi hai ki Air India thik se chalai nahi hai. Agar thik se chalai nahi hai, तो एयर इंडिया को ठीक से चलाने वालों को दे दीजिए वो भारत का हो क्योंकि अपने आकाश पर अपना प्रभुत्व किसी भी देश को मंजूर नहीं छोड़ना एयर इंडिया केवल दिखती है वैसे नहीं इसके पीछे इतना बहुत सारा है जो शायद गिना नहीं जा सकता कुछ टेंजिबल है कुछ इंटेंजिबल है लेकिन उसका महत्व है ऐसे हमको देखना पड़ेगा इन सारी बातों को well, and Somit Sarkar is standing by with the big brokerage calls of the day. Somit, what do you have for us today? Uh, good morning, Alex. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is Angel Broking on Parag 24. So the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 333 rupees. Now, according to the brokerage, Parag is likely to be one of the key beneficiaries of shift towards the organized sector. Now, the brokerage is also expecting the organized sector's contribution to the dairy industry to increase from current 22% to 26%. Now, the Parag milk is also shifting focus to value-added products with, with which offer higher margins. Now, currently, value-added products contribute nearly 66% to the total revenue which is expected to increase to around 75% by financial year 2020 which will also lead to highest margin expansion for the company in the industry. With improving margins the company is also expected to see an improvement in its return ratios and cash flow which will in return reduce the company's debt. Lastly it expects companies revenue and net profit to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 13% and 27% over FY18 to FY20. Second we have is Mothila Loswal on LNG finance the brokerage has maintained its buy rating on the stock with a target price of 240 which suggests a potential upside of 41 percent now according to the book brokerage post equity raise the nbfc is now well capitalized for growth and it also says that there won't be any need to raise more capital for at least the next three to four years now the shift towards real estate finance is likely to translate into strong growth in the coming years for the company also the non-fund based businesses is on a strong growth trajectory and the brokerage is expecting the contribution from this business to increase over the time of period. Lastly, it says that the valuations are at a discount to peers and the recent correction offers an attractive entry point when it comes to LNT finance. Thanks, Amit.
Now, moving on to some of the stories that you'll find on the website, BloombergQuint.com. Of course, over the course of the day, you'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. But uh, here are a few stories that you should consider reading. First up, Fortis Healthcare has indicated its inability to engage with IHH Healthcare Berhad uh, due to its binding agreement with TPG-backed Manipal Health Enterprises. And the Income Tax Department has given more time to Deepak Kochar and his firm New Power Renewables to respond to its notice, according to a government official. Now, here's something that we should all be proud of. The Indian contingent at the recently concluded Commonwealth Games in the Gold Coast have come back with India's third highest medal tally. Not just that, the athletes who bagged the 26 gold medals did so in some record-breaking performances. Here's a look as, at India's record breakers at the Commonwealth Games. great way to start your Tuesday. I'm inspired. <laughs> There's a lot more coming up on the other side of this very short break, starting with all you need to know. Thanks so much for watching. This is Bloomberg Quinto.